Reflections, Transforming the Mind, Part 4. Excerpts from Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard. In Part 3 of this series, we spoke in detail regarding the power of feelings and how they impact our lives. Part 4 will expound a bit further into how the author expresses the importance of understanding our feelings and how they influence our spiritual life. Feelings have special relevance to our contemporary life and to spiritual formation under modern conditions. We now live within the life form called modernity, where revered ritual and personal relations do not smoothly govern life because human solidarity in family, neighborhood, school, workplace, church has been pulverized. There are few things of equal significance to this fact for serious Christians to understand today. In the modern condition, feeling will come to exercise almost total mastery over the individual. This is because people in that condition will have to constantly decide what they want to do, and feeling will be all they have to go on. Here lies the secret to understanding contemporary Western life and its peculiar proneness to gross immoralities and addictions. People are overwhelmed with decisions and can only make those decisions on the basis of feelings. More than a century ago, Leo Tolstoy experienced the effects of modernity in the circle of wealthy, upper-class Russians who made up his world. In that world, he relates, my life came to a standstill. I could breathe, eat, drink, and sleep, and I could not help doing these things. But there was no life, for there were no wishes, the fulfillment of which I could consider reasonable. Had a fairy come and offered to fulfill my desires, he continues, I should not have known what to ask. This is exactly the world of pointless activity portrayed in such staples of the contemporary American consciousness as television's Cheers, Seinfeld, Friends, and Will and Grace. In the course of events, however, Tolstoy became involved in the life of the Russian peasants. I saw that the whole life of these people was passed in heavy labor and that they were content with life. And they all, endlessly different in their manners, minds, education, and position as they were, all alike, in complete contrast to my ignorance, knew the meaning of life and death, labored quietly, endured deprivations and sufferings, and lived and died seeing therein not vanity, but good. The peasants whom Tolstoy admired so much were not yet swallowed up in modernity. They had solid traditions of faith and community that provided a ritual form of life and of death. The result was that they knew what was good to do without regard to their feelings. Good was not determined for them by how they felt or by what they thought was the best deal. The same was true for the homemaker and the wage earner of our recent past. Not to say that all was well with them or with Tolstoy's peasants, but individuals in their roles knew without thinking about it what to do with their minutes, hours, and days, and only rarely were faced with having to do what they felt like doing. The overall order in which they lived usually gave them great strength and inner freedom derived from their sense of place and direction, even in the midst of substantial suffering and frustration. In a situation such as today, by contrast, where people constantly have, or think they have, to decide what to do, they will almost invariably be governed by feelings. Often they cannot distinguish between their feelings and their will, and in their confusion they also quite commonly take feelings to be reasons. And they will in general lack any significant degree of self-control. This will turn their life into a mere drift through the days and years which addictive behavior promises to allow them to endure. Self-control is the steady capacity to direct yourself to accomplish what you have chosen or decided to do and be, even though you don't feel like it. Self-control means that you, with steady hand, do what you don't want to do or what you want not to, when that is needed, and do not do what you want to do, what you feel like doing, when that is needed. In people without rock-solid character, feeling is a deadly enemy of self-control and will always subvert it. The mongoose of a disciplined will under God and good is the only match for the cobra of feeling.
Generally speaking, feelings and emotions are fostered and sustained by ideas and images, though social or bodily conditions also factor in. Hopelessness and rejection, or worthlessness and not belonging, live on images, often of some specific scene or scenes of unkindness, brutality, or abuse that have become a permanent fixture within the mind, radiating negativity and leaving a background of deadly ideas that take over how we think and structure our whole world. Such images also foster and sustain moods. What we call moods are simply feeling qualities that pervade ourselves and everything around us. They are, of course, extremely hard to do anything about, precisely because one cannot stand outside of them. Clinical depression is an extreme form of a bad mood, but dread, deprivation, and deficiency, as well as simple anger, fear, or pain, can become moods of the negative type because of the capacity of feelings to spread and pervade everything they touch. On the positive side, there are feelings and moods associated with confidence, worthiness of good, being acceptable and belonging, purposefulness, love, hope, joy, and peace. Being accepted in the beloved, Ephesians 1 6, is the humanly indispensable foundation for the reconstruction of all these positive feelings, moods, and their underlying conditions. We must be very clear on how the negative feelings rest on ideas and images. Those feelings can themselves be transformed by discipleship to Christ and the power of the gospel and the spirit, through which the corresponding ideas and images are changed to positive ones. And we must be clear that the person given to moods faces special difficulties, though not insurmountable ones, in spiritual formation. Now, the realm of feelings may appear on first approach to be an area of total chaos. But this is not so. There is also order among feelings, and it is a much simpler one than most people think. When we properly cultivate with divine assistance those few feelings that should be prominent in our lives, the remainder will fall into place. What then are the feelings that will dominate in a life that has been inwardly transformed to be like Christ's? They are the feelings associated with love, joy, and peace. For the sake of simplicity, we shall simply call them love, joy, and peace. Though, as we have noted, love, joy, and peace are not mere feelings, but conditions of the whole person that are accompanied by characteristic positive feelings. Love, joy, and peace are, we recall, the three fundamental dimensions of the fruit, note the singular, of the spirit. They mutually interpenetrate and inform one another, and naturally express themselves in the remainder of that one fruit. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Faith, confidence, and hope are also very important in properly structuring the feeling dimension of the mind and self. But they play their role in that regard in subordination to love, joy, and peace. That is, because of their relationship to them. The three primary dimensions of the fruit, love, joy, and peace, are in fact not separable from the three things that remain of 1 Corinthians 13:13, 13, 13, faith, hope, and love, and of course are partially identical with them. All are focused on goodness and what is good, and all are strength-giving and pleasant even in the midst of pain or suffering. That is not what we seek them for, or something we try to make of them. It is, simply, their natural attire. Hope is anticipation of good not yet here, or as yet, unseen. It is, of course, inseparable from joy. Sometimes the good in question is just deliverance from an evil, which is here. Then, we are saved by hope, Romans 8.24, and we rejoice in hope, 12 verse 12, because, if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it, 8 verse 25. That eager anticipation strengthens us to stay faithful to God and to stay on the path of what is right. One of the remarkable changes brought by Jesus and his people into the ancient world concerned the elevation of hope into a primary virtue. Hope was not well regarded by the Greco-Roman world. 
it was thought of as a desperation measure. And while, according to the myth of Pandora's box, it may be all we have left with which to endure the agonies of life, it must be grimly held in check, or it will give rise to vain expectations that only cause more misery. Christ, by contrast, brings solid hope for humanity. Clearly then, hope also is closely related to faith. Faith is confidence grounded in reality, not a wild, desperate leap. It is, as Hebrews 11.1 1 says, substance and evidence or proof, not, as contemporary translations usually have it, subjective psychological states such as being sure of, or having a conviction of. Rather, faith sees the reality of the unseen or invisible, and it includes a readiness to act as if the good anticipated in hope were already in hand because of the reality of God. Compare 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. Jeremy Taylor drives the point home with these words. He that believes dares trust God for the morrow and is not more solicitous for the next year than he is for that which is past. No one worries about what was going to happen last year. Accordingly, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, Hebrews 11.27. Egypt and its king were in the realm of the seen. Moses was able to disregard them and to stick with his goal, because he saw the one who is invisible, but nonetheless real for that. For he endured, as seeing him who is unseen, verse 27. That is faith, as the Bible portrays it. Romans 5, 1 through 5, outlines an instructive and inspiring progression from an initial faith in God through Christ, with an accompanying initial hope, to a subsequent or higher level hope that does not disappoint. The Apostle Paul wrote this way because, in the progression of our experience, the Holy Spirit pours out into our own hearts the kind of love God has. This important passage needs to be studied in depth for any adequate understanding of spiritual formation in the Christian tradition, especially as it concerns feelings. The initial faith in Christ gives us our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, verses 1. This is the new birth into Christ's kingdom. It puts an end to the war between me and God that has gone on most of my life and surrounds me with God's gracious actions. Now, because of Christ's death for me and his continuing graces, I know that God is good, and I am thrilled with the hope that God's goodness and greatness will serve as the basis of my own existence as well as of everything else. Thus, we exult in hope of the glory of God, verse 2. But this opens the path for transformation of our character. I am also thrilled about my tribulations. I know that they will prove God's power and faithfulness in love to me and to trust him in all things becomes my settled character. Therefore, we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, verses 3 to 4. But godly character now brings about a different quality of hope, verse 4. Character is a matter of our entire personality and life which has now been transformed by the process of perseverance under God. Hope therefore now pervades our life as a whole. And this new and pervasive hope, which is an outgrowth of our initial hope of the glory of God, but now covers our entire life, does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Verse 5. Thus faith in Christ and the initial hope it inspires lead us to stand in the grace, the action of God, and standing there leads in turn to a life full of love. What exactly is love? It is will to good or benevolence. We love something or someone when we promote its good for its own sake. Love's contrary is malice, and its simple absence is indifference. Its normal accompaniment is delight, but a twisted soul may delight in evil and take no pleasure in good. Love is not the same thing as desire, for I may desire something without even wishing it well, much less willing its good. I might desire a chocolate ice cream cone, for example, but I do not wish it well. I wish to eat it. This is the difference between lust, mere desire, and love, 
as between a man and a woman. Desire and love are, of course, compatible when desire is ruled by love, but most people today would, unfortunately, not even know the difference between them. Hence, in our world, love constantly falls prey to lust. That is a major part of the deep sickness of contemporary life. By contrast, what characterizes the deepest essence of God is love, that is, will to good. His very creation of the world is an expression of will to good, and it is then to be expected that his world would be found by him to be very good. Genesis 1.31 His love and goodwill toward humans is therefore not an add-on to a nature that is fundamentally careless or even hostile. It is another expression, one of the more important ones, of course, of what he always and in every respect is. It is not hard for God to love, but it is impossible, given his nature, for him not to love. Our human world as we find it is not like God, though it was intended to be. Love is not natural in our world, though desire or lust certainly is. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, the apostle said, is all that is in the world, 1 John 2:16. Pride is defined by desire, not by love. It is above all the presumption that my desire should be fulfilled, and that it is an injustice, a crying shame, and an injury if they are not. Lust and pride all around us inevitably result in a world of fear, for they bring us into a world of little dictators, and the most likely thing is that each person will be used and abused by others, possibly destroyed, and at least not helped and cared for. Our families, which should be a refuge from such a world, often turn out to be places where victimization is at its worst. The dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence, Psalm 74, 20. The tender young are initiated into an adult world hardened in evil. A baby is not even safe from its mother while in her womb. And he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey, Isaiah 59, 15. Injury brings pain and loss, then fear and anger, which mingle with resentment and contempt and settle into postures of coldness and malice, with brutal feelings that drain the body of health and strength and shatter social well-being. And so, practically speaking, the renovation of the heart in the dimension of feeling is a matter of opening ourselves to and carefully cultivating love, joy, and peace. First, by receiving them from God and from those already living in Him, and then, as we grow, extending love, joy, and peace to others and everything around us in attitude, prayer, and action. For many of us, just coming to honest terms with what our feelings really are will be a huge task. Paul says in Romans 12, 9, let love be without hypocrisy. That is, let it be genuine or sincere. To do only this will require serious effort, deep learning, and quantities of grace. Our ordinary life and our religious associations are so permeated with insincere expressions of love, often alongside of contempt and anger, that it is hard not to feel forced into hypocrisy in some situations. But we can learn to avoid it, and we shall immediately begin to see what a huge difference that alone makes. But there is much more to do. Very few people are without deep negative feelings toward others who are or have been closely related to them. Wounds carried steadily through the years have weighed us down and prevented spiritual growth in love, joy, and peace. They may have seeped over into our identity. We wouldn't know who we are without them. But they can be healed or dismissed if we are ready to give them up to God and receive the healing ministry of His Word and Spirit. This applies similarly to hopelessness over not achieving things long sought or long lost. In general, the task once we have given ourselves to Christ, is to recognize the reality of our feelings and agree with the Lord to abandon those that are destructive and that lead us into doing or being what we know to be wrong. This he will then help us with. We may need to write out what those feelings are in a letter to the Lord, or perhaps confer about them with a wise Christian friend who knows how to listen to us and to God at the same time. Perhaps individuals or our fellowship group can have a prayer ministry to us. 
journaling about progress with feelings can also help. It can bring to light the ideas and images or past events on which the destructive feelings are based. Those, too, will need to be replaced or revised. Many such details may play a role as we progress toward predominance of love, joy, and peace in that dimension of our mind and ourself that is our feelings. We can be very sure that this is God's intent for us. Thus Paul prayed for his friends in Ephesus that they would be rooted and grounded in love and know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Ephesians 3, 17 to 19. And we have seen the intent of Jesus, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be made full. John 15, 11. Also his, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. John 14, 27. And here is Paul's benediction to the Romans. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 13. Understanding of the role of feelings in life and in the process of spiritual formation is absolutely essential if that process is to succeed as it should. There are many ways we can go wrong with reference to feelings. They are extremely influential on all that we are and do, much more so than they should be for our own good, and mainly because we accord them greater significance than they deserve. They, more than any other component of our nature, are the trigger of sinful action. If you consider all of the Ten Commandments after the first two, for example, you will see that it is feelings out of control that lead to their violation. In his own magnificent treatment of the moral life, Jesus makes a point of putting anger, contempt, and lust in their place, Matthew 5, 21 and following. Until that is done, nothing else works. We have noted how we go wrong in trying to manipulate feelings themselves without regard to their underlying condition. It is often done with good intent, but it is nearly always harmful to the deeper interests of the soul. That is especially true when we try to stir up feelings as a means of getting people to do what we think is good in the course of efforts at Christian ministry. Feelings have a crucial role in life, but they must not be taken as a basis for action or character change. That role falls to insight, understanding, and conviction of truth, which will always be appropriately accompanied by feeling. Feelings are not fundamental in the nature of things but become so if we assign them that role in life, and then life will not go as it should. Many sincere professing Christians suffer in their walk with God because they made a commitment prompted by a feeling of need, and not by insight into how things are with God and their soul. Partly because of this faulty basis of commitment, the area of feeling is, I suspect, the most likely place of defeat for those sincerely seeking to follow Christ today. Satan uses feelings to captivate us today by making them more important to our life than they really are, as well as by inducing much false guilt about what we do and do not feel. Nowhere is this more obvious than in marriage and divorce as now practiced or mispracticed. But at all stages of adult life, feelings are among Satan's primary instrument they are used to devastate the soul in the processes of aging, sickness, and death among Christians and non-Christians alike. This need not be the case. Appropriate spiritual formation in Christ will prevent it. We must understand how love, joy, and peace can be our portion in every state of life and can lead us into a radiant eternity with God.